without a bar. This episode of Three PNRs featured on the UnX Network. Welcome to 3 P and R. I'm your host, Adam R. And joining me for this episode is David Marler. David, how you doing, sir? I'm doing well. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for allowing me to be here. Thank you for coming. I'm very, I'm really excited to talk to you. Since the start of this podcast, I've heard your name. I can't tell you how many times. <laughs> oh, hopefully in, in a good context. <laughs> oh, all good context. I mean, it's so let's open up with this. What got you on the path of ufology? Yeah, well, to be honest with you, Adam, uh, my father, at a very early age, I uh, was born in 1968, growing up in the 70s. And at that time, there was a lot of uh, UFO activity and a lot that was being reported, uh, believe it or not, looking back on it and, on mainstream news, Walter Cronkite and other people talking about UFOs, especially in the year 1973, which is, of course, a pivotal year with regard to UFO sightings across the country. And that same year, there was a wave of sightings in a small southeast town called Piedmont, Missouri. And my father had been born and raised there. But uh, when I was growing up, we all lived in the St. Louis, Missouri area. And it had generated so much interest, this series of sightings down there, that local St. Louis media in the form of television and newspapers were uh, documenting it and generating a lot of interest. And so as a result of that, many people in the St. Louis area, including my father and my older siblings, were piling in the car on weekends in the spring and summer of 1973 to go down to Piedmont to look for UFOs. And that was my first exposure to the term UFO at an early age of five years old. And I remember the excitement, the anticipation, my father and my brothers and sister loading up in the car with thermoses of coffee, binoculars, and just hearing the stories that they came back with, they never saw anything themselves in the trips they made down. But uh, my father's relatives and people he grew up with had some fairly dramatic sightings. And it just, it flipped a switch at a very early age. And then, oh, there was a successive series of, uh, of events in the 1970s and then through the 1980s that just kind of solidified my interest over time. Yeah, I know a lot of people have dramatic personal exposure or sightings to UFOs that that hooked them. But mine was really just being exposed to the subject over a period of years. And um, but like I said, I, I have to chalk it up to my father, though. His interest kind of rubbed off and became contagious. And now I have the bug and have had it for 32 years actively investigating this subject in the field. Well, it's a good thing because you have a lot of data. I mean, uh, a lot of data, but not necessarily a lot of answers, as I always like to qualify. Uh, you know, lots of data doesn't necessarily equate to answers. But yes, uh, I've been very fortunate uh, over 32 years. Uh, naively, I, I went into the subject uh, actively in 1990, Adam, and thought, well, you know, I want to learn about this UFO subject. And of course, the internet was very early at that stage. And I thought, well, I'll go to my local library and, and check out a bunch of books. And I was completely shocked and dismayed. And again, looking back on it, it was so naive. But the local libraries, multiple branches had little or no books on the subject. And so it really kind of crossed my mind in a casual sense, not in, in, in any formal sense, that if I want a library, I'm going to have to build my own. And of course, I was thinking just maybe a bookcase or two of you know some of the classics from the field, but now it's kind of developed into this burgeoning collection. And it's really a collection of collections. A lot of aging researchers and researchers that passed away uh, have bequeathed their collections to me. And so I have a diverse history of, you know, 75 years uh, of the subject uh, and in various forms, uh, reports, newspapers, news clippings, film, slides, photographs, audio recordings, microfilm. Uh, it just runs the gamut. And uh, I'm just so ecstatic to be able to provide that information to serious researchers. And on a weekly basis, I get requests for case files, information, news clippings, and it just you know, as a fellow researcher working with other researchers, it, it it just really warms my heart that I'm able to provide information that furthers their avenues of research. And it's good because you're spoken about a lot. Everyone I speak, I speak to that, that do research and are out there doing you know, the, the, their work, like they're in the field doing it. You're yeah. mentioned every time. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's encouraging. I mean, that's nice to know. I, uh, 
I, I've always kind of taken a humble approach towards the subject. I've also taken a pragmatic approach towards the subject, Adam. And by that, you know, as, as you and your audience knows, um, the UFO field has lots of belief systems. Uh, people believe this, people believe that. And with all due respect to individuals, we're all entitled to our beliefs and our philosophies on life. I've always said, and I include myself in this indictment, that with all due respect, belief doesn't enter into the picture if we're trying to study this as a serious research uh, study. And, and by that, I mean, we need to look at the facts and the evidence devoid of belief. And, you know, we need to go into this objectively. And if we're going to cite resources, they need to be credible resources, not unnamed sources, not random emails out of the blue, not spurious government documents that we can't verify. And so I, I think perhaps one of the reasons why my name comes up so often is because I try to stay true to the data. I try to stay true to my audiences. And as I like to say, people may not always agree with me, but they'll never quest question where I, I got my, my information or derived it from. Because in my lectures, for those that have seen, it, seen them across the country over the years, I always cite my references, which unfortunately many even very high level well-named researchers in the field quite often spout a lot of stuff, but they don't tell you where they're getting it from. Yeah. That's, and that's a problem in a lot of cases too, because that's what gives it part of the stigma, you know? Um, oh, absolutely. And uh, I always believe, you know, our arguments only as strong as our, the weakest link in our argument. And when you have, uh, you know, holes in your story or holes in your logic in approaching the subject so large, you could drive a Mack truck through it. Um, it's no reason that we often suffer uh, the slings and arrows of skeptics and mainstream scientists that question. And, you know, I disagree a lot with some of the, the big skeptics that are out there, but I, I have to say, in all honesty, the skeptics, even sometimes when they're far, far afield of the facts, they do sometimes call out UFO researchers for fallacies or for errors in judgment or for lack of detailed investigation. And so in a sense, some of those skeptics help keep us true to form in that sense. Yeah. I mean, it, there's balance. And we, like, like you said earlier, um, when you have a strong belief, it's, it's almost like approaching something with filters on. You're not prepared to, to learn everything. Absolutely. I, you know, people always ask me, well, what's your theory on UFOs? What do you believe about UFOs? The only thing I believe is that the subject needs to be studied more intensely. But as far as pet theories, uh, you know, people talk about it, the extraterrestrial hypothesis, time travel, ultra dimensions. Uh, yes, no, maybe all the above. Uh, I, I certainly don't claim to have insights into the quote unquote answers to the subject. And I, I would caution people to run away from those that do. I, and I'm, I, I kind of liken it to religion. You know, when you have a, a preacher standing up there and he tells you what he knows God wants of you, I always say you need to be running in the other direction. <laughs> yeah, honestly. <laughs> and the same holds true for ufology. It, it's true. It's in any belief. Listen, religion, I say this a lot. It's a great thing. It's got a good positive Absolutely. message. Until Absolutely. it's yeah, until it's in the control of a charismatic person who has a self-interest, then it's a problem. Absolutely. In fact, uh, it's, it's funny we're going down this avenue because uh, it, I prepared a whole new lecture series on my research on triangular UFOs. And perhaps we'll have time to talk about that during the show. Oh, no, we definitely um, will. Because that, when I, when I heard you speak on it, I, when I first heard your name, because I'm, I'm new to the ufology, right? Sure. When, when I first heard your name, I, I watched some of your lectures and read some of your stuff. It's compelling. It's, it's yeah, not it, like it I've ever heard it, before. Well, it, it's compelling. And again, I base it all. It's all predicated on contemporaneous reports from the 40s, 50s, 60s, and even sometimes earlier than that. And so it's not like we're talking to someone today who claims they saw a triangle back in 1964. No, we're pulling up, going through the historical archives, the news clippings, newspapers, Project Blue Book files, other government files from that time period. And so we're not trying to create a revisionist history by looking back and, and falsifying records. These are the historical documents that exist. And um, what's interesting, though, talking about belief systems is at the beginning of my new lecture that I'll be presenting this year, uh, I talk about the fact that uh, belief, it, as you mentioned, Adam, can be a fine thing, but it can also be taken to clinical degrees. And by that, I mean, one of the lectures I'll be giving will be at the Ozark Mountain UFO Conference uh, in Eureka Springs, Arkansas in April. And I'm going to tell that audience what we're talking about right now. And I'm going to say, and I'm not simply throwing out abstract concepts. 
I say this because I was at this very conference in the early mid nineties, a year before the Heaven's Gate cult committed suicide. And oh, members yeah. of that cult were attending the same conference that the year before they committed suicide to try to draw new recruits. So we're not talking abstract ideas. I've seen it firsthand. I've yeah. seen where belief can lead to disastrous results. That scared me. I, I, re, you know, I didn't know much about that. I, I recently, where did I see that? I saw it was like a documentary. And yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> I was blown away yeah, by that. So, so again, you know, just one example, but uh, we need to really, again, divorce ourselves from our preconceived beliefs. I believe if we're going to be honest with all, all, of, all of us, each other, uh, that we don't know what we're dealing with. That's why we call it a mystery. And so certainly we can come at it from many different perspectives. And I, I highly encourage that. Uh, people will often send me information about quantum physics, or they'll talk to me about their time travel hypothesis regarding UFOs. Those aren't areas of my interest in, insofar as where my research is focused, but I'm certainly open to it. I, I'm open to anything that, again, is predicated on the data, that is supportive of the data. Uh, again, with the understanding that this might be a valid hypothesis, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the answer. So I'm really encouraged, Adam, over the last, oh, what, uh, since really 2017 with the New York Times article, right. December 2017, uh, I was I was doing my math here. It's like, how many years has that been already? Uh, but uh, what, we're going on what, uh, six years? Is that six years? This that, year? We're, gonna, we're going on, uh, yeah, just about seven. seven. Or, no, yeah. no, six years, six years. Six I'm years. Sorry. I forgot we're in 2022 yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm still stuck in 2021. Right? <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, it, we have a whole new generation of people and not and not a generation based on age, but even older people that I've talked to older than myself that for decades never gave the UFO subject a second thought. And based on, of course, the DOD videos, the Navy personnel coming forward with their own personal encounters of UFOs or UAPs, it has opened the door. In fact, uh, I will tell you, I had two of my my good friends and mentors, to be quite honest, in the field, uh, Barry Greenwood and Jan Aldridge, two of the leading historians on the subject. They were here in the room that I'm sitting in now, the research room, and we did two consecutive weeks, day, day in, day out, scanning and collecting material because our goal is to eventually digitize all this and make it free and available to a worldwide community online. Um, we were sitting here and I had a gentleman that had reached out wanting to come by and it happened to coincide with Barry and Jan's visit, but he was a uh, banker from New York and his interest was peaked starting in, no surprise, December, 2017. And so he came out, we had a wonderful discussion. I'm hoping to actually see him again later this year at one of my, my upcoming talks across the country, but uh, he, he wants to come back. He had no idea the amount of information that was here, but those are the types of people I'm dealing with. And one other one, before I forget, Adam, again, I've been doing this now as a, I started 1990, so this is 32 years now I'm going into. For the first time ever, I have had retired Air Force colonels contact me wanting to come and see my archives. I did a local Albuquerque radio show, live radio show, and one of the gentlemen called in because I'd mentioned that I have Dr. J. Allen Hynek's original case files here. I'm the, the curator for KUFOS, and we have all of his original documents here, as well as the historic NICAP uh, UFO case file collection. And the gentleman called in and said, I'm a retired lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, and I would love to come by and see your Blue Book material. So I asked the producer to, the, to get his name and number offline. And um, about, I think, two or three weeks after that, he came over. But prior to coming over, he said, Dave, do you mind if I bring a friend? He's a retired colonel in the Air Force who was in charge of advanced weapons development for the Air Force. Wow. Now, the caliber of people that are coming here to see the material that I've gathered far surpasses all the years prior. I've never had retired colonels and lieutenant colonels wanting to come to my home to seriously sit down and talk about the UFO subject. So I only use that as an example that it truly is a game-changing moment as it relates to the subject and that gradual erosion of skepticism across the country and the world for that matter. Indeed. And I'll tell you what, here's what I do. I, I talk to a lot of cops, detectives, right, for the show, homicide guys. Sure. Sure. Uh, and even the off podcast detectives talk about, I mean, a lot of them are mm -hmm. very interested. And to, to the point of what you're making, as a kid, I was fascinated by ufology, uh, Absolutely. But, I, but I lost it in my teens. You know, you're shooting pool, you're listening to Panther, hanging out with your friends, you, you lose it. But 2017, yeah, pew, 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 pew. 
puberty has something to do with that too, right, Adam? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> girls, girls are more appealing than that. Yes, absolutely. So when 2017 rolls around, and for me, that it's done. UFOs yeah. are real. You can't deny it anymore. After those videos, everyone, and there's still people out there that are like, they're not real. Like, are you kidding? Oh, they're absolutely yeah. real. I think yeah. people misunderstand what that means. It's an, an object that's un, unidentified, and it's absolutely. in our airspace. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm not evoking the term extraterrestrial when I talk about those. Sure. I, I mean, I, the only question is what's behind the wheel, right? That's, that's well, Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, to your point, I mean, we're, we're not dealing with this fundamental question that we, we've kicked around for, for decades. Uh, are UFOs real? Despite the consternation and disappointment surrounding the Pentagon report last year, for all intents and purposes, they officially acknowledge the phenomenon is right. real. I agree. And you know what? That's a spoon feed because you know how it is. You, just like we were talking about earlier, there's some people that are diehard. They they believe what they believe what they believe. Right. And UFOs right. are just a devil. If they do park, that's the devil. Right? That's their explanation. Right. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And uh, uh, the way I like to characterize it, because I think people, and in fact, I was invited and I was shocked that I got this call one day sitting here in the research room back in, uh, I believe it was uh, dis January 2021. Uh, I got a call from RTVI, Russian Television News, and they asked, would you be willing to go on live Russian news tonight to talk about this pending Pentagon UFO report? And I was just surprised, where did they get my name from? And of all the people in the field, I was just shocked that they wanted to interview me. But I spoke with uh, Harry, the anchorman, and uh, through our translators, and I, I told him at the time, now, mind you, this is January 2021, you know, about six months, five months before the Pentagon report was due out, that I think we all need to temper our expectations. And again, I don't say that arbitrarily. I say that because we've had decades long denials regarding the subject. Don't expect them, as many people were envisioning, to see them roll out the crashed saucer and dead aliens <laughs> from Roswell. Um, the, but the way I like to characterize it, Adam, is we didn't have disclosure with a with a capital D, as many people envision and dream about. Right. But we did have disclosure with a lowercase D, because as you as you and I were acknowledging earlier, they did officially acknowledge there is a phenomenon. Yeah, and there's two parts to that. One, well, there's two things I'll say. One, disclosure is going to we have to spoon feed because some people are just not ready. And two, they're not the absolutely re the reason they're going to speed up disclosure. And I've said this a lot. Private industry is going to space now. Right. Oh, sure. And Jeff Bezos. And I, I said this a lot. Jeff Bezos is up. He's got celebrities on board. They got cameras and phones. And if there's something yep. up there, that's viral. You're not suppressing that information. No. no Two, that, you, yeah. The other thing is you, your investment into the subject is very well balanced with data versus belief. You're, you're right. In this, you, you have a really good balance. So that's why I hear a lot of people bring your name up anywhere from the ufology investigator to paranormal to some of the detectives. Cause You've been on a lot of shows, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the more recent ones was unidentified. And you're more, uh, the best way to say it is like you're you're a good representative as far as the subject goes because you're, you're, you're very evenly balanced. You're approachable. And Well, I really appreciate that because that, that is actually what I strive to do. I, I see, as you can imagine, uh, cringeworthy individuals uh, representing the field of ufology making the most outrageous claims. Right. And I sit and it's so funny, Adam, when I do like local lectures here in New Mexico, where I live, uh, I've done, you know, various adult groups, school groups, uh, organizations and, and so forth. Inevitably, the question comes up, the hands are raised during Q&A sessions at the end of lectures. Uh, so, you know, do, do you like ancient aliens? <laughs> and I say, well, with all due respect, I said, I'm not a huge ancient aliens fan. I said, I don't mean to, to you know, uh, take issue with anybody on that. But I said, that's not research. Right. That's speculation. I said, you can look back. It's don't get me wrong. It's fascinating. It's a fascinating show. And some of the ideas that, that they explore are fascinating. But I'm interested in tracking down witnesses. I'm interested in finding corroborative information to look back three or 4,000 years and speculate what did this tribe envision or what was their goal in wanting to build this monument. And to have your default explanation always be extraterrestrial. You know, I sometimes take issue with that, but right. there is credible material today that we can go back and look at. And, and I, I mention that because there, one of the areas I've had success in, Adam, and I think it's just my tenacity, because when I get myself into a case that I really, really like, I want to pursue it to the nth degree. But I've tracked down a number of eyewitnesses, historical eyewitnesses to events that occurred quite literally from the, the late 60s, early 70s 
going back to the 1940s, a gentleman, and just the best example I can think of, uh, is a gentleman that I interviewed uh, here in New Mexico. I gave a local lecture, and a gentleman came up who used to work at Los Alamos National Laboratories. And he said, you know, Dave, I really enjoyed your talk on the history of UFO or UFOs in the state of New Mexico. And of course, I touched on the green fireballs that were sighted, you know, from, from the late 40s into the early 50s. And uh, he goes, you know, there's a gentleman I know, he's a good friend of mine. He worked at Los Alamos long before I did. He's in his 90s. He's getting ready to turn 99 years old. He was a security guard. I believe it was in 1948 or 49. And he saw one of these green fireballs that were highly anomalous back then. Long story short, he was able to facilitate an introduction. My wife and I went to meet with him, sat in his home in Albuquerque, and I was able to do an, an initial interview with him. But he was so fascinating because his mind was so clear for a 99-year-old gentleman that I asked him, I said, you know, I brought my camera equipment. Do you mind if I get an on-camera interview? And he's like, no, that'd be fine. And so I was able to secure an on-camera interview, him describing this incident from the late 40s of one of these green fireballs. And sad to say, but no surprise, uh, right after he turned 100 years old, he passed away. But the point is, we can still track these witnesses down, even from cases from the 1940s, as I've demonstrated. And to capture that information, you know, for all of us that have had aging relatives, you know, we look back and, you know, when these people die, it's almost like you're burning a book. All that knowledge is lost yeah. unless it's somehow conveyed to the next generation. So in interviewing him and in interviewing other people, there was a young man that was burned by a UFO in 1964, a case that was basically uh, overlooked for the most part, to be quite honest with you. I went back in and I found contemporaneous newspaper articles. I was able to find other information and ultimately track the individual down and actually became good friends. He's now a good friend of my wife and I and, and he and his wife. But he basically went underground after this ex experience happened and the initial media exposure. And I was the first person to get him to go on camera and talk about it and uh, was able to provide additional information that even he wasn't aware of regarding his case. Well, you know, people like you are important for this because, like you just said, if this inf these people die, so does the knowledge with them. And that's that's the moving forward. I think in the future, historically speaking, it's going to be necessary for your data. So we can have comparisons to when we actually have the real deal here. Now we get to see the history of that. Absolutely. And the best example of that, of course, has been my research on triangular UFOs. Um, so many people think these things are so prevalent today, which they are. And many people say that, well, they must be military, which some of them might be. I don't rule that out as a possibility. Where I take issue is where people say these triangles are relatively new to the field. No. Well, no. <laughs> if anybody's read my book, I've demonstrated an ample history. And Adam, I'm here to tell you, and for the first time publicly, the new lecture I put together for this year was a comprehensive review. People, you know, quite often ask, well, what have you been doing during COVID? You know, you're under lockdown. What have you been doing? Well, I've been going through all of the NICAP case files and uh, Dr. J. Allen Hynek's personal blue book files from 1947 all the way up to 1977, which encompasses about 12 to 13 four and five drawer file cabinets of case files, just to give you an idea how much material I've sifted through just in the last calendar year. Out of that, I found over 102 historical triangular UFO reports. And I have to tell you, as a researcher and author, it was the most uh, validating experience because I, these files have never been seen by the general public. I certainly hadn't seen them before. Otherwise, I would, would have incorporated them into my book back in 2013. The cases that I was finding demonstrated the exact same flight characteristics, visual characteristics, and principles that were demonstrated in the initial data sets I was working on when I wrote my book. So it, it, it just really emphasizes that, that working profile I created where there's 10 primary and 10 secondary characteristics that demonstrate the modern reports, but also exemplify these historic cases. Huh. You know, I, I so I, I have this thing where I don't read people's books until I talk to them because I want I want the, the interview to be clean, right? Sure. So now sure. I'm gonna now I'm gonna order. But here's something, let me read this to you. <laughs> I, I get a lot of people that talk about the triangles, I do a lot of off air uh, interviews because a lot sure. not a lot of people want to be exposed. Oh, of course. One thing I'm getting a lot, I was dying to ask you this question. 
they're all telling me they're flying backwards. And I can't understand why they're saying that. <laughs> they are. And uh, th 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 I'm glad you brought that up, Adam, because that's one of the most unusual characteristics of these triangles. And in my new lecture, I talk about the fact that the cases we're going to be looking at are from the 1950s, 1960s worldwide. And admittedly, for some context, let's talk about triangular aircraft. You know, there were a lot of delta wing aircraft being created. One that was uh, really interesting, it was the uh, Vulcan bomber in the UK. Right. And what's interesting, though, are the triangles back in the 60s that were being reported. You know what they when you, you know what the local uh, phrase for those were in the UK at the time? They called them silent Vulcans huh. because they looked like a Vulcan bomber, but there was no noise. And they had the ability to hover and do many of these other characteristics. But um, but no, uh, you know, some of these triangles could be military. And by that, I mean the modern reports, but not the ones that appear to be flying backwards where the flat side of the triangle is the leading edge. Yeah, that's what he was saying. I found out when he, I've heard, and this is not just that one person, David, this is several people I've interviewed. I was, oh, absolutely. I, was I, I, I thought that they were confused. Like there's no way, <laughs> right? But no, 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 no. There's some, uh, in my book, there's a blue book report where they have a witness sketch and it, th it shows an equilateral triangle with a bright white light at each point. And there's three arrows that the witness drew indicating direction of flight and the flat side of the triangle was the leading edge. And that was, I believe, and readers may correct me on this one, but I think it was 1960, if I'm not mistaken, that that case occurred. Huh. Many, many other reports, including the out of the 102 case files that I've pulled out of the archives uh, that I'll be sharing with audiences this year, I have additional reports. In fact, I have an audio clip. One of the beautiful things, Adam, uh, when I acquired the NICAP files, my old friend and fellow archivist and researcher, uh, Rod Dyke in Seattle, Washington, contacted me. He's like, hey, Dave, we haven't talked in a while. He goes, I heard that you acquired Dr. J. Allen Hynek's material in the KUFOS case files and NICAP case files. I said, yeah. I said, I'm in the process of working on them and reorganizing them and consolidating files and getting them, you know, a little bit more organized. Um, and he said, well, when Richard Hall passed away, he, I bought his entire audio tape collection. So this essentially were the audio recordings, the reel to reels from the 50s and the 60s uh, of witness interviews, television shows, news broadcasts. He goes, I bought these from Richard Hall and they've been sitting in boxes. I've just not had time because he's a very busy businessman. Never had time to get around to working on those. He, to his credit, I, I've always promised that I give him public credit at some point, Adam. Uh, <laughs> to his credit, he with no charge and a lot of shipping cost on his end, sent me these large boxes filled with audio recordings. And prior to working on the historic files, pulling these triangle cases, for about eight months prior to that, my project was digitizing and digitally remastering all of these recordings. And I believe the oldest one goes back to 1957. Nice. Um, nice. And these are rare, one-of-a-kind recordings, which, thank goodness... Uh, the quality were still decent, most of them. And I was able to even digitally remaster some of those. And so uh, I think a total of 221 audio recordings were now preserved and digitized. Wow, that's work. That's a lot of work. One of those, though, I will tell you, Adam, was an interview with a witness from, I believe, 1964 in Pennsylvania describing, and I have the case file, but now, as you can appreciate, I have the case file and I, I'm able to take these historic recordings and reunify those, bring those back together again. And in my audio lecture, I have audio clips from those digitized recordings. In this case, the Pennsylvania case, gentleman from 1964, and he said, the thing was coming at us. It had the flat side of the triangle as the leading edge. I have a sketch that shows that. And it's the same characteristics that we're hearing today, which again, I, I, I in my heart of hearts and, and logically, you can't say all the triangles today are military if we have these same objects, same lighting characteristics, same flight dynamics that were being exhibited in the 1940s, 1950s. The idea that we had that technology back then and have kept it under wraps, I know a lot of people like to believe that, but I think that's a, a revisionist history bordering on the delusional. Uh, I, I just simply, and talk, people I've talked to within military and intelligence circles uh, agree. They said there's just... If we had that technology, we would have been utilizing it, not not dealing with inferior technology like F-18 Super Hornets. Right, exactly. And, you know, to your credit, here, let me read this to you. 
One of the off-air podcasts, this is from November. He cited a, uh, a triangle. He's in the, the Burbank area, California. Mm-hmm. There's no way to are aerodynamic. He's, what he's telling me is this thing was as thick as a building. That, yeah. How does that fly like that, right? There's no way well, we're doing that. Absolutely. Adam, the way I always like to phrase it is, and it really kind of exemplifies what we're talking about. If these things are have thickness, to your point, are flying with a flat, blunt side as the leading edge, you're basically saying these things are aerodynamic as a brick. Right. It, it would fall in the sky. This guy described it as being as thick as a large building. Yeah. I oh, mean, yeah. What, what I, I, I do have some reports like that. In fact, I have a beautiful sketch from a case near Springfield, Missouri. Uh, a friend and a fellow researcher, uh, I purchased her entire artwork collection from investigations that she had conducted over the years. And there's a very similar triangle like that that looked like a building. It had thickness to it. Uh, and uh, again, whether Wait. we're talking triangles or UFOs or UAPs in general, if it was just eyewitness reports, eh, interesting, but I wouldn't be that interested. But beyond eyewitness reports, many of these triangle cases, like other UFO reports, as your audience knows, has radar confirmation, has yeah. other types of information to corroborate eyewitness testimony. One in particular uh, I've talked about in my previous lectures was over Albany, Georgia, and this is directly out of Air Force Project Blue Book files. And I did a uh, documentary for the Smithsonian Channel where they did a pretty good job of recreating this visually. But it was at Albany, Georgia. A, a pilot was flying a solo flight at night, and as he was dry, as he was flying, he noticed this very sharply defined circular light. And by that, in the report, he stated it didn't scintillate or twinkle like a star. It, it didn't have a diffused outline. He's, it was a very sharp cookie cutter type edge to it. Yeah. As he's flying and he's looking at this light, uh, which, by the way, was above him, uh, it started to alternate white, orange, white, orange, white, orange. And it would cycle like that every few seconds. And that caught his attention. It piqued his interest enough as he continued to watch it as he was flying. He thought, well, maybe it is a star or a planet. Maybe I'm, I'm being deceived. So in the Blue Book report, he states that he increased altitude within a few minutes. And his idea, the rationale was, I'll increase altitude if it's a star or planet. It's not going to change perspective much. Well, to his surprise, as he increased altitude based on the Project Blue Book report, the light that was above him was now below his aircraft. So clearly, a celestial explanation was not going to fit the bill in this case. So then, as he sees it below him, the report states he then descended and tried to increase speed to close on the object to get a better look. One of the most bizarre cases that I've come across yet, Adam, is this one. In the blue, and again, it's, it's beautiful. You have the original Blue Book report you can see this in. Uh, as he closed on the object, the light transformed into a glowing dark red triangle, which then divided into two triangles, one slightly above the other. And then after a few seconds, they disappeared. Huh. You know, I'd spoken with Steve Murr uh, about frequencies and uh, what we believe that they're using for to manipulate the, the surroundings and move about is something with frequencies and vibration, which is why you see the air being atomized around it and the light. That, oh, absolutely. And so, absolutely, yeah. I, and and I, I'm encouraged by so many physicists getting involved now because uh, I will, I'm, I'm a researcher and historian. I'm not a physicist. So I love when we can bring these people to bear on the subject and start looking at these cases and bringing those insights, because contrary to popular belief, as far as the general public goes, certainly not you or your audience, who's, you know, I'm sure very well, uh, 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 you know, educated on this subject, there are hundreds of thousands of reports. And I say that because this year, 2022, marks the 75th anniversary of the term flying saucer. It was 75 years ago this June, that Kenneth Arnold had his famous sighting that launched the quote-unquote modern age of UFOs. That's right. And he did, and what he saw wasn't actually disc-shaped. It was, it was more like a delta wing. Yeah, delta wing or crescent shape. Right. Uh, and so, absolutely. And uh, it's interesting. I, 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 again, I, I'm kind of pulling pages from my lecture that I'll be presenting this year. But based on two things, we need to be focusing more on our history regarding this subject. We need to continue to investigate the contemporary sightings and cases, but let's not neglect the history. And I say that for two reasons. One, what we just touched on, 
This marks the 75th anniversary of the phenomenon. 75 years, seven and a half years of civilian military worldwide documents chronicling people sightings, including radar confirmation, etc. But in addition to that, we have this whole new group of academics that are coming into the field, which again, I highly encourage the more eyes and brains, the better. We have Dr. Avi Loeb with Harvard. We have NASA and all these organizations. SETI has even kind of intimated that they might be interested in looking at the subject now. Most of them have stated, either directly or indirectly, though, we're not going to focus on the history. We're only going to focus on cases moving forward. And I think they're doing it for two reasons. One, if you go back into the history, then you have to basically involve yourself with the UFO community to, to some degree. And it's kind of guilt by association. Right. I like to say that these newcomers in the field they're not UFO researchers, they're UAP scientists. I know it's parsing words. But well, I'm glad you I, said that. That's the, the way the government gave themselves separation by what well, they changed the acronym. Yes. So this way and it wasn't so, a silly subject. That's how they're going to move on it. Exactly. So it's, it's trying to, I think, change the narrative a little bit, change the language. But uh, with all due respect to Dr. Avi Loeb and all these other researchers that have uh, suggested that, I think it's it's somewhat foolhardy to ignore seven and a half decades worth of information. And I say that simply because it being intimately involved in the files that, and materials I have here, and, and certainly that's just the tip of the iceberg, um, how can you disregard seven and a half decades worth of information if you've never taken the time to see what's in there? Yeah, it's not good science. You know, like the Tic Tac, for instance, that's been observed for you know, hundreds of years, right? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. We didn't call them Tic Tacs, right. but certainly cylindrical objects, uh, tube shaped objects, cigar, uh, cigar shaped you know, objects. I'll absolutely. tell you why. It's because no one in the past got nearly as close as the, the pilots got to it. They didn't have the oh, ability. Absolutely. So absolutely. In the past, yeah. you're seeing this in the sky at night. It's lighting up. So you, it's cylindrical. It's cigar shaped. But when you get up close and it, there's one report uh, I read and it's from the I believe it's the 20s. And they were talking about they saw a cigar in the, in the sky. Mm -hmm. And when I oh, hear yeah. that, and then you do them, uh, you kind of figure out like what the shape of this Tic Tac is. We're like, all right, that's what they're seeing. It's oh, yeah. I mean, it, you know, as, as you and your audience know, I mean, going back even into the 1800s and earlier, there's reports of anomalous objects in the sky. But beyond the airship sighted in 1897, between 1897 and, of course, uh, Kenneth Arnold uh, ushering in the modern age of UFOs, we had, of course, the Foo Fighters uh, in 43, 44, 45 in the Pacific in European theaters during World War II. We had the ghost rockets that were occurring right after World War II in 46 primarily. Uh, but even in the 1920s and 30s, there were waves of, and these are lesser known reports, uh, ghost flyers, like mystery airplanes that were seen that didn't make any noise, that looked highly anomalous. And so you know, there, there's a there's a plethora of reports and types and waves out there over the decades. And unfortunately, you have a lot of the academics that kind of fall into this category that say, well, it's just cultural influences of science fiction or this and that that influence people into believing they're seeing these things, which I think is a gross uh, misrepresentation of the subject matter. Uh, especially, again, when we do have cases involving radar, where it's clearly not just hallucinatory in nature. One that I will mention just briefly, I've done extensive research on the famous Battle of L.A. incident from 1942. I have a lot of the original newspapers, front page newspapers, news clippings. I have an original photo of the famous photo of the, the object in the convergence of searchlights. And have done an exhaustive amount of research with the declassified documents Barry Greenwood obtained in the 70s and 80s. Towards the end of my lecture, I don't say what it is or what it was, this mysterious object or objects, but I simply go through process of elimination, as we should with any of these, these reports, and trying to find prosaic explanations. Many people thought that that, that uh, whole incident was sparked by Japanese military flying over Los Angeles. We have official declarations on file by the Japanese military at the conclusion of World War II that they had no military operations over that area at that time. We also have a letter from the 1970s from one of the first officers of a Japanese sub that had shelled an oil refinery north of Los Angeles, up near the Santa Barbara area, 36 hours before. In his own handwritten testimony from the 1970s, he stated, after we shelled the oil refinery, we went back out to the Pacific, did not mention the Battle of L.A. incident at all. 
Hmm. Uh, but you also have people saying, well, maybe they were just American flyers flying. Well, flying during a blackout with any aircraft fire, that's basically suicide. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> um, but we also have, again, going back to the data, verifiable information through the National Archives and the research efforts of Barry Greenwood, we have uh, uh, correspondence between two army generals where they stated, we did not have planes up in the air at that time. The rationale was they thought this initial object could have been a reconnaissance plane, which was the vanguard of this huge aerial assault that was impending with the Japanese uh, Imperial Navy, that, that this was just the beginning and the main onslaught was yet to occur. So they had pilots in their planes, fueled up, ready to take off, but they didn't want to dispatch them prematurely because, as the general stated to the other general in the correspondence, we didn't want our planes up in the air half out of fuel when the Japanese attack actually hit. So they weren't military, American military. They weren't Japanese military. People said, well, maybe it was a weather balloon. I have found that, in fact, there were one, possibly two weather balloons that became uh uh, dispersed that night into the air and were mistaken for objects during the, the, the this whole uh, aerial event. But one of those was shot down early in the night, and yet people were still reporting seeing this object. And the most important thing are these two things. People said, well, it was just jittery war nerves. Well, going back to the, the cultural explanations, um, I make two important points. The government documents also in detail describe the fact that preceding this whole incident of the sighting of this unidentified object and the firing on it by any aircraft batteries, a target was inbound coming in from the northwest over the Pacific towards the Los Angeles area. It was tracked for 120 miles by three separate radar systems. Now, radar was crewed in 42. I'll be the first one to say that. But there were, I believe, two long-range SCR-270 and one uh, SCR-268 radars. All three converged on one target, tracking this thing coming in immediately prior to this in incredible display of uh, aerial gunfire. And in addition, we have a, the photograph taken of this object in the convergence of searchlights. So as I like to always say, you can use the cultural explanation or say jittery war nerves, but neither one of those can be tracked on radar or photographed. Right. Or survive that much gunfire. What is it? A or survive balloon? that. <laughs> and in fact, the object made two passes over the greater LA area. Each time it was fired on by multiple uh, rounds of any aircraft fire, um, three inch shells, uh, 50 millimeter shells and 37 millimeter yeah. guns. No balloon's going to survive that. Well, and have the ability to make that type of course correction. Right. And, and it literally, based on all available data points that I've looked at in the newspapers and correlating that with the government documents, I've been able to plot uh, on a map of L.A. as it looked in 42, but long before the interstate system went through there, and plot all of these locations. And essentially, the object came in uh, uh, over um, the uh, coast in, in towards Santa Monica, close to the Los, An uh, Los Angeles Hollywood area, dropped down along Long Beach. 20 minutes after the firing died down, it came back, reverse direction over Long Beach, went in over the Signal Hill area, and then came back out and uh, di disappeared uh, off the coast again. So that's one incredible weather balloon. Indeed. <laughs> and you know, and do I don't think we'd, uh, I don't think we would, I think I want to see these Warners, but I don't think we would react that way if it was moving like a, a balloon. If well, Adam, I'm glad you said that because something I, I always forget to mention in going through and collecting a lot of these original uh, front page newspapers, again, uh, you know, December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor, that's where everything changed, uh, especially on the West Coast, because we thought, okay, you know, it's just a matter of time before the Japanese invade mainland United States, specifically Washington, Oregon, California. And so uh, what's interesting, though, is people said it was jittery war nerves. But that happened uh, over yep. two months yep. after Pearl Harbor. I found and I have in my collection an original front page newspaper that I believe happened 10 days after Pearl Harbor, where they did a blackout in Los Angeles and no gunfire, no chaos. Everyone was calm. So I simply offer this. If it was jittery war nerves almost two and a half months after Pearl Harbor, why wasn't it jittery war nerves in just the week following Pearl Harbor? You would think that would be 
when right. people were at a heightened state of alert and panic. Well, if you look in uh, if you look in history of other countries that have anti air weapons, even Iraq, when we were there in the early nineties, they didn't take fire until they had absolute visual confirmation they're over us. Absolutely, and, and, absolutely. And so many people firing these weapons here in America, they're not going to just fire at a balloon. They're going to they're going to confirm visually there it is, and and that's a it's a threat. Let's fire yeah, upon it, that. Absolutely. And, and, you know, some of these explanations, I think, fly in the face of, of these these veterans, these heroes that were that were uh, attempting to defend the country at the time. Uh, it, it I think it's an insult to their intelligence that it was such a failure that uh, they everyone just went into a state of panic and were shooting at nothing. In fact, when you look at the government documents, there was a series of alerts that went out. And I believe it was a low, and I could be wrong. It's been a while since I've looked at my Battle of LA documents, but I believe it was a l- alert code green, uh, which means uh, confirmation of target and uh, you have the orders to fire. And so, yes, it wasn't just, you know, people suddenly going rogue. They got direct orders and confirmation to fire on th- this object or object. You know, it's it's a thing that the skeptics do. And I find it to be really irresponsible and, and disrespectful, just even to our military pilots when they're... <laughs> They're trying to explain well, these videos away like they're yes. like other aircraft. You can't do that. These are trained well, observers. Absolutely. I was going to say, we're seeing it now in the modern age, right? Where, right, where we have these Navy pilots where it's an insult to their their intelligence, but it's also an insult to our own training of these Top Gun pilots. Right. <laughs> I mean, if we have these individuals that are hallucinating or can make such gross misinterpretations, with all due respect, they shouldn't be flying these multi-million dollar planes. But they are. And the fact that they are underscores the fact the military trusts them, trusts their training, trusts their judgment and their perspectives. You know, let me ask. This is what I think. This is, I have a lot of theories uh, in some of the previous podcasts. One, you know, you could listen to it. I'll, I'll direct you to it later on. But I have a lot of theory. Currently, I, I think we're under a long term observation because we have definitely been being studied since the beginning. Right. Of, of man. Mm-hmm. I don't think mm-hmm. they're a threat to us because they wouldn't wait this long for us to have a military presence like this to, sure. to, to quote unquote, take over. Yeah. So I think we're the national geographics. We're one planet of many planets being observed by higher intelligence. It's well, it may sound like I'm contradicting myself earlier. I said I don't have a pet theory, but to echo what you said, one of the things that makes more sense, let me just phrase it that way, right. is exactly what you said, that this is a massive longitudinal study over hundreds, perhaps thousands of years watching a developing culture from right. infancy to wherever we wind up if we don't exterminate each other in the process. Um, and, you know, I talk to many people over the years and they say, well, when I hear about the UFO subject, it, it scares me. And I always say, well, keep in mind that, you know, with maybe rare exception, uh, they don't seem to be overtly hostile. Uh, we're still here. They're still floating around, flying around. So I, I don't feel that you know we should fear these things. But a point I like to bring up, Adam, because I feel it needs to be clarified again and again and again. On social media, the internet, and elsewhere, I see a lot of these people take uh, umbrage to the fact that people are saying, well, these are a threat or a potential threat. We have to keep in mind where we're hearing those statements coming from. Yeah. They're coming from individuals that are either active or retired military and intelligence individuals. Their job is to view everything as a potential threat. That is, that's their training, that's their background, and that is the reason that they are there. And I sleep better at night knowing that they're there doing that. Agreed. And so the key word is potential threat. Uh, I I don't believe that they're hostile, at least based on the available evidence thus far. But I and it's funny because it's almost prophetic because I wrote this in my book back in 2013 in my uh, conclusions and recommendations, where I I basically formulated and consolidated all my information as almost an intelligence briefing report. And I believe I use those exact words, a potential threat uh, to national security. Uh, and I stated, even though the, the historical record shows that their behaviors are relatively benign towards humanity, uh, at any point in time, based on variables we can't imagine, what if that project suddenly took a turn tomorrow, next week, yeah, a year had, from like, now? Like they had to scrap it. I see what you're saying. 
People that have worked in think tanks, the Battelle Memorial Institute and others, they're paid to work out what if scenarios in preparation for, you know, potential possibilities down the line with foreign adversaries or other things. I have to believe they had drafted contingency plans if suddenly overnight these things did become hostile. I think we'd be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> well, yeah, I, you know, I, if, if I was a betting man, I think I'd be betting on whoever's operating these things. <laughs> I mean, I, honestly, clearly, they're technologically superior. There's a couple things here. One, like, and I say this to, I get asked by my friends and people that know me anyway. They're like, well, you're really in the subject now. What do you think? I'll tell you what. Picture of like what we do. I, I always take whatever we do and then I scale it up a thousand. Sure. So when we're studying an animal in the wild, right? We, it's our job is to keep, if we can help it, have them not even notice us. We're there to observe them, right? And so in studying that animal, we don't get involved. If anything's going on, they get into a fight with another group of animals or whatever the case may be, we, it's nature. We don't get involved. But right. if we hit one with our car, we're now obligated, right? We have Oh, to. absolutely. And just like us, we tag animals all the time. We do experiments on them all the time. We want to know how they work. We're going to, you know, dissect them. It's just what we do. So when people are like, right. well, you, you think these abductions are real? I'm like, well, of course. If we're being yeah. studied, absolutely they're real because it's part right. of the study. <laughs> well, it, yeah, it's just it, it, exactly. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I, again, do lectures for the general public and they say, you know, I can buy UFOs, but that whole abduction thing is just too much for me to accept. But it's easy for us to talk about it because we've been immersed in the subject, uh, you know, for many, many years yeah. and have an interest for many, many years. But it's you have to look at ufology like arithmetic. You can't go to a five-year-old child and start talking calculus. You have to start them with basic arithmetic, division, multiplication. Then you can gradually work your way to, you know, calculus and trigonometry, et cetera. Right. It's the same with the general public. If you tell them that there's alien beings that are abducting individuals from their bed and from their cars and we have no control, of course it's not palatable. Of course it's over the top for them based on their background knowledge of the subject. Sure. But if you create a foundation where you say, look, there are credible civilian military reports involving sightings of anomalous objects in the sky. Some of these have actually created physical effects with animals, vegetation, ground, etc. Some have created electromagnetic effects that have impaired electrical devices. Uh, you, you, you take them on that journey. It's like, okay, objects, I accept that. Okay, if there's objects, then they could possibly interact with physical things around them. Then we go to, as I like to say, 1954 with the the, one of the largest waves of UFO sightings in France and Italy, and more specifically, sightings of small humanoids near the vehicles, collecting soil, vegetation samples, etc. It's like, okay, objects flying around, affecting areas around them. And okay, if there's, if there's objects or aircraft, for lack of a better term, there could be pilots like we have. Okay, I can accept that. Well, if you go that far... It's just the next step to your point, Adam, to say, what about interaction yeah. between them and us? You know, listen, I was, I'm in a pool hall one time and I've had this discussion with a friend of mine and he's like, there's no way the abduction. I was like, all right, let me ask you a question. What does science know about frogs? He's like, why? So just, what do we know? We, we know do we know what organs they have? He's like, yeah. Well, how do we know that? Well, we cut them open. Like, would we have known that with just our bare eyes? <laughs> it's part of science. <laughs> you have to dissect. You have to. If you're going to study a species it, and you want to know everything about it, it's going to be invasive and it's going to be observant. You know, I mean, you can't have one without the other. It's impossible. And yeah, here's the absolutely. thing, too, about the 50s. I want to bring this to your attention. I didn't re think about this until I read something about it. And it wasn't, it has nothing to do with ufology. It has everything to do with uh, uh, crops and culture. Mm -hmm. um, it just happens to be that those sightings went up again in the 40s, 50s, et cetera, because we just got done blowing up nuclear weapons, testing them, and in war. How did it change the soil? How did it got into the atmosphere? It's a whole new study. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, again, uh, you and your audience, I'm sure, are well acquainted with this. There does seem to be a strong correlation between nuclear weapons, nuclear storage sites, nuclear power plants, and UFOs. No surprise, to your point. Yeah. And, and you know, another thing, too. A lot of paranormal and ufology uh, incidences, and just not by nuclear stuff, but even just large electric stations. Very close observing. They're even like, and it's kind of funny. I, I do this. So here, I'll give you this. I do this with a lot of people. 
<laughs> we're, we're compared to ants, right? I hear sure. it a lot. It blows my mind when you hear this because let me tell you, maybe we like, wouldn't be that interesting because you know, we're like ants to them. Well, I'll tell you what. If you and I are walking in the park and we saw an ant mound and they were driving combustion engine cars, they had a complex society, they were having wars, we're closing that park and we're watching that ant pile forever. <laughs> you know? Sure. We're going to sure. want to see how they evolve. We're gonna, it's a really interesting subject now. Well, it, it's interesting, you know, as we talk about this, um, because I've had people over the years, this is prior to the the recent disclosure, you know, in 2017 with the New York Times article, but people would always, you know, ask me about the nature of the UFO cover up, you know, why, why, if they're covering this up, you know, why are they covering it up? And I've always kind of been of the mindset that beyond the objects themselves and perhaps occupants, as we were discussing, um, I don't think it's so much that they're covering up the UFO subject uh, because, you know, especially as we get into the 80s and 90s, really, really to be quite honest, uh, post, you know, moon landing um, with you know, the space shuttle and things like that and, and the Mars, uh, the Mariner Mars uh, project back in 76, um, people could, for the most part, I think, wrap their minds around, again, I'm just going with the extraterrestrial hypothesis for a moment, just, just to speculate, uh, we have a space program. We're sending probes out. We're sending astronauts out. Maybe someone's doing the same thing. Yeah. Most people, I think, could deal with that. But I, I think that, you know, with the UFO cover up uh, over the years, I think a lot of it. Well, one, a practical side, I have to mention this practical side is any any country on the planet that can harness that technology will rule the world. So, of course, we've got that angle. But beyond that, uh, in order to, main domestic, to maintain domestic tranquility, um, it's not just telling people maybe that it's UFOs coming from point A to point B. What if, again, speculation, these are interdimensional in yeah. nature? That's a whole different story to tell the American public who has the average intelligence level of a sixth grader right. that, well, they're not objects coming from another planet. There's parallel dimensions that coexist with ours, and these things quite literally could be standing next to you in a parallel dimension, and you don't know it. And at any point in time, the objects or beings can cross that barrier and take you into their dimension. I mean, this that's a whole other ball of wax to try yeah. to convey that to the public, and that could cause panic. That I mean you basically have just unraveled their fundamental concept of what reality is. I said this a lot too, man, because I, I know people, I'm related to some of them, right? Where they know that they know that they know God made here and here only. And if you if you were to bring an alien in front of them, like, nope, that's the devil. I'm certain of this, right? You, you can't unchain. Some people just don't make room for that. They don't they don't expand on their, their level of thought. It's well, scary. They, they don't. And uh, it's interesting, you know, real, real briefly on, on religion. I've heard a lot of positives from some people, though, that um, and, and usually it's more it's more the uh, the priests, the rabbis, people of, of that caliber that say, well, if there are other life forms or other dimensions of, of reality, it's it's just, you know, it just makes the, the creation that much more glorious and sure. ultimately the creator. I mean, I'm, I'm good. Look, in my mind, and I've spoken to a lot of afterlife people, a lot of paranormal people, and I've come to the conclusion after seeing the cosmic web and the way our brain, our brain still most complicated computer on the planet, but mm -hmm. a, a very similar design to, to the cosmic web. And even when you start looking at things as like the spider web, and there's a construct that seems to be very similar across the board. So sure. I'm under the impression there's some, there is some form of architect. I don't know mm -hmm. what, what it is or what you call it. But it seems intelligent, like our moon, for example. I, I didn't notice till recently, David. Someone brought it to my attention. I looked it up. Our moon is the only moon in our solar system that we know thus far that's the size it is relative to our planet and stays perfectly in a circle around us. And it, it, like It's almost like clockwork, the way we have um, lunar solar eclipses, lunar eclipses. It's mm -hmm. the only moon that behaves that way. It seems like it's engineered almost. Well, again, who's to say? And and that's that's really the underpinnings of what we're talking about. And really, this this could be extrapolated with the paranormal in general beyond the scope of UFOs. Um, you know, who are we to say what is and isn't? Right. And but at the same time, tempering that with uh, avoiding the the rabbit holes of belief. 
It's one thing to consider possibilities. It's another thing to accept readily those possibilities. But we have to look at possibilities and use that as kind of a, a stepping stone towards doing objective investigation. Uh, it's like, okay, we can think this, but now let's look at the data. And does the data right. support that? Yeah, I mean, look, it's like they say, if you brought a smartphone back to the 15th century, you're going to get you're going to get killed. <laughs> you're oh, <a> absolutely. Witch. <laughs> absolutely. And that's just, and that Adam is a great point. I, I use a similar analogy of taking it back to Alexander Graham Bell and saying, you know, here's our phone from the future. And he would look at that and say, well, where's the Magneto hand crank yeah. and where's the wires you try. And then, you know, his mind would probably explode if he saw the LCD screen, right? The right. touch screen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we're talking only a matter of a little over what a hundred years. Well, yeah, that's true. Um, I was talking to someone about that the other day. We've only really been like, we've only really had cars for a hundred, uh, 120 years. But that's, that's beyond it. the temp beyond the temporal distribution, you know, going from the, the late 1880s to now, we're talking human to human technology. What if we're dealing with a technology not a hundred, hundred and twenty years, but say five thousand years yeah. ahead of us? But more specifically, to to separate ourselves from the example we just used, something separated by 5,000 years that is, by definition, alien. That's true. Yeah. I mean, you know, dude, is it, I'm glad you said that because uh, ancient Greece, I was reading another study because I, I, there's a computer, like something like a computer. They've had clocks. I mean, the ancient Greeks had remarkable ideas, like uh, pending ideas. And I mm -hmm. asked, like, why did that stop? And then I found out why. Rome went in there with Catholicism, and that, that was over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the school of free thought yeah, uh, so, suddenly was constrained. So we're like 2,000 years behind the ball on technology. Now, if we, we did what we did, let, let's not even use a 100-year reference. What did we do in 20 years with phones? Imagine no. 5,000 years from now. <laughs> yeah. Well, and not even 5,000. Let's just simply, let's be conservative. 200. Yeah. I mean, we're leapfrogging. Our technology is evolving faster than our, than humans. <laughs> Absolutely. It's you know, scary and, business. And some people have speculated that th these UAPs that are being seen, uh, perhaps they're not manned. Perhaps they're completely, uh, you know, automated and motivated by AI technology. Well, you know, that's, I'm glad you said that. Because I have my, my theory personally uh, you know, about the gray, the smaller gray alien anyway. I think those are uh, biotic, but you know, advanced biological robots with a, mm -hmm. a subconscious upload or they're being remotely controlled. I also yeah. think when people are talking about other races of aliens, again, we're the National Geographic, so there's other races. They're probably like, listen, we'll rent our grays to you to go down there, whatever experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, we, <laughs> we have guarantees. They've been doing it for a long time that they work fine, right? Right. So, so I say right. that. I, that's my personal theory now. I so I had a kid once. I asked a, uh, a kid. He was ten years old. Friend of mine's uh, son said, "If we're going to build a robot to go to Mars and, and and explore, what would it look like?" And the kid drew, not even kidding, a bipedal robot, right? And so then I I go to a friend of mine. And by the way, if you're listening, uh, I did I I didn't tell you why I asked this, but now you're going to know. I asked him. He's a, he's an engineer. I said, "If you want to build a robot to go to Mars and explore and do science, what would it look like?" And by twenty minutes later. He drew a bipedal robot with storage in his compartments. <laughs> well, like, there, there you go. If it ain't broken, yeah, don't so, fix it, right? <laughs> you know, so, you know, I think it's great to be able to kind of speculate along these lines because in, in absence of solid answers, there is that vacuum. And we try to fill that with ideas, thoughts, and hopefully those ideas and thoughts, again, going back to the research, will we'll direct research into those areas because speculation is a great starting point, but it, it's not the end point. Right. Uh, and so as we develop these ideas, it'll hopefully for, you know, lead to further lines of research and avenues of investigation. And I hope that, again, we can look at the, the data we're collecting today. I wish that we would have more data from the government. Uh, you know, I think coming it, soon. I think because of the, again, private industry is going to space. You're not going to suppress those guys. Yeah. Well, growing up when I, you know, was a kid, I mean, it was all NASA. NASA had complete right. monopoly on space uh, as far as the United States goes. And, uh, but to your point, the, the landscape has changed. It's now every man for himself and Jeff Bezos and others, uh, like you said, have crossed that threshold and Bob Bigelow and, and many others. Yeah, there's more you know, because Jeff Bezos did it. Every it's, It seems to be a trend. Whenever Jeff Bezos takes that leap into something, 
It's like the other billionaires, like, nope, he can't be the only one. Let's beat this guy somehow. You know, it's just, right. it's a weird thing. That it's really competitive with money. Strange. Well, it, it, but but ultimately, com- uh, competition historically fuels innovation, as we all know. Right. I mean, most of the incredible technologies of, of the 20th century, when you look back historically, uh, most of them came out directly or indirectly as a result of World War II. Yeah, it's true. It is true. And then and the competitive edge of that alone, like Kennedy. We're going to you the know, moon. We're doing it at the end of this decade before yeah, they do. Unfor- it. Unfortunately, you know, it's not just uh, competition; it's conflict in that case, yeah. uh, World War II. But, but truly, I mean, it, it does. It, it really steps up the timetable. It allows us to put our petty differences aside and, with laser focus, you know, develop certain areas of technology. Yeah, and um, and so yeah, it. it it is such an interesting time, Adam. Uh, my two daughters, they're growing up and, uh, you know, one's a teenager, one's getting ready to be a teenager. And it's a fascinating time to be alive right now. It really is. Uh, as it relates to space, not just with UFOs, not just with these UAP revelations, but with, you know, the James Webb telescope, yes. <laughs> you know, being deployed. I mean, it's a regarding space, the universe and our place in it. We are at a fascinating time right now. I spend a lot of time learning about space documentary. I go to bed at night with space documentaries. You know what I mean? I, I lo- I'm completely, fa- especially when you look and f- you figure out how small you are in comparison to what's out there. It's, you know, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, you feel, you, you feel even less than a speck of sand on the beach, right? Yeah, for real. Like when I first started going down the, the hole of like, you know, the universe might be a sphere amongst many universes and, and like, I was depressed that night. I was like, my God, I'm not like I'm so insignificant in comparison. And then the well, idea to think that we're the only living thing anywhere, no way. That's crazy. Well, and it's it's interesting too, because you know, we are starting to see, as I mentioned earlier, the erosion of skepticism. But I've always been somewhat plagued by the fact that UFO skeptics always use the term believe like it's a four-letter word, but yeah. talking about watching the the space shows and documentaries at night on Science Channel or Smithsonian or any of the others, uh, I ch- always challenge my audience. UFO skeptics attack UFO researchers because they call us UFO believers, and UFO r- researchers and believers believe this, believe that. The next time you watch one of those shows, keep a little notepad next to your chair or your bed with a little pencil. And listen how many times Neil deGrasse Tyson, Seth Shostak, or any of these other scientists use the word believe. Well, astrophysicists believe this. We believe this regarding black holes. They can't prove it. They believe it. That's true. And it's, it's interesting that they have complete license to use that word and have it applied to them in a, in a respectful way. But the moment that we say, well, we believe this might be the case, we're suddenly crucified for it. You know, you're right. And listen, for everyone in academia and otherwise, or scientists, anyone, after the 2017 videos from our our military, how dare you even question whether there's something out there or not? It's impossible. It's it's, it's at set point, you don't want to believe it. That's you're the opposite of believing. You don't want to believe it. You can't come to terms with it. It's too, it's, it's, I don't know. It, it, I've heard skeptics attack people on theories, and I, I, I try to reference this often, but today's theories were yesterday's imagination. Today's Absolutely. theories are tomorrow's science. And well, <laughs> it starts uh, somewhere. It, well, and for that matter, uh, science fiction. I mean, we look back at Star Trek, and, and a lot of that stuff has now become a reality. Yeah. Not, only, not only the instruments that they use, but the ideas of warp drive. I mean, <laughs> we have mainstream astrophysicists talking about warp drive capability and super luminal travel. Um, you know, th- the things that were science fiction and, and folly in the 1950s and 60s, a lot of it has become reality. And so we don't simply draw that line and say, well, at one time we thought this and then it became reality. Well, no, today equally holds true. People 40, 50 years are going to look back on us today and say how archaic our thinking was, how yeah, stupid really. we were. How did we not know that X, Y, and Z was occurring? Um, it's it's interesting. We we have our moment in time and we think that we're the pinnacle of knowledge. And, uh, you know, history has one thing. It, it teaches us humility. <laughs> it teaches yeah, us facts. how <laughs> wrong we were. And science certainly, uh, you know, has has seen that time and time again. Dr. Heineck always used to use the analogy, which I think is beautiful, 
that, you know, back in the day, people would talk about stones falling from heaven. And the idea of stones falling from heaven was ludicrous. Well, take, take the objective reality, rocks coming out of the sky, and apply it with our new knowledge of the universe and astronomy and our concept of understanding what meteorites are. Right. Yeah, you know, you're right. You know, like this, it, there's people today, they're like, we're the, we're the most successful nation on the, in the world. Like, I don't know. There was this place called Rome once and they had a lot of real estate. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they, they had a good run, but you know, <laughs> it's just, let's not let it repeat. It's, it's, it, you're right. The way people view one another, if we're going to be inter, interplanetary species or explore space, we definitely need to erase racism, uh, politics and religious beliefs. Not that I'm saying they're bad, uh, but I'm saying we have to start seeing each other as a whole if we're going to well, do that. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, people always say, why don't the UFOs land on the White House lawn? It's like, well, just turn on the news tonight and see what Russia is doing to Ukraine. Yeah, honestly. Uh, and, and, you, and I'm just using that as one of many examples. I mean, you look at the history of humanity and we are typified by tribal conflict yep. based on land, resources, religion, philosophy, political ideology. Uh, until we can get along as a species, why would they attempt to make communication with us when we have so many prejudices amongst ourselves? I was talking about this too recently with uh, like Neuralink, what Elon Musk, Musk has put down and some other scientists talking about this, almost a similar product. When you get to the point, or you could communicate without words. There's just a knowing at set point. You should realize that our differences are, are external. It's foolish. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. when we start communicating like that and we start recognizing that these differences make no sense and we start behaving like a species, I think that's when they reach out. That'll be the point. Well, and you know, it's so funny. People talk about evolution like it was. We're still evolving. Yeah. It's an yeah. ongoing, ever-changing process, and we will continue to, to evolve as a species. Our awareness, our paradigms, our perspectives will hopefully continue to open to larger realities as we continue to progress and develop as a species. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're just at one point in time. And uh, to your point, uh, you know, perhaps we've been monitored for many, many centuries, if not longer. I think so. And uh, we're just one data point in a long series of data points that has occurred and will continue to occur. Before we close out, let's talk about TR3B. It's being thrown at me a lot. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I the, got the it. I, of my, it's the bane of my existence. Yeah, I, I got to ask it because I, so every time I hear this, I have to ask like TR3B that... Sounds like something man would do, right? So, mm -hmm. Sure. And sure. then I look it up and it turns out it's like supposedly a project we're working on to, uh, I guess, replicate what it is that our guests have. Yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, the, the, the problem with the TR3B is, and, and I, have to, I have to delineate what we're talking about here. I mentioned earlier, I believe some of the triangles that are being seen today could be military aircraft, not the ones doing the exotic characteristics that date back centuries, but I'm talking simple aerodynamic triangular platforms, uh, the next evolution in the B2, for example, you know, right. going along that line of thought. Um, and there's evidence to support that there are those things, uh, triangles that have been seen with contrails, which clearly are suggestive of con conventional propulsion technology. Right. Um, but um, yeah, the TR3B, I, I love the comments that I see where people will post a video and they'll say, oh, it's just the TR3B. <laughs> like we, we absolutely positively know it exists. Like, oh, that's my car parked in the driveway. Um, the fact of the matter is we do not know there is a TR3B. The fact of the matter is there is no verifiable evidence that we have a TR3B. And the story, as with every narrative in this UFO subject, you, it gets back to what I say about research, Adam, you have to go back to the source follow the trail. Where did the story start? It started with one man who is now unfortunately, unfortunately passed away. His name was Edgar Fouché, who claims and documentation, I think, amply suggests he did work at Area 51. Um, and he claims that this is all back engineered technology and that we've mastered it. And now all the triangles people are seeing are U.S. military assets. Um, the problem is, and unfortunately, like Bob Lazar, it's a story. Yeah. <laughs> no evidence to back it up. You either believe him 
or you're on the fence, or you don't believe him. Um, and again, he, in his story, when you, when you dig into it uh, and look up his old interviews and such, uh, he talks about the fact that we started developing this, I believe he said in the 80s and the 90s. Well, how do you explain all the triangles that I documented in my book? And how do you explain the 102 plus cases that I've just pulled out of historic case files? Yeah, you know, no, that's not to mention the uh, SR-71 project was long before, and that's where we got the idea for the stealth program. Oh, the SR-71 is one of my all-time favorite aircraft. Yeah, I just same. love that design. Yeah, I do that uh, same, because it, it just it looks like how a badass plane should look, and it exactly. flies like one, so yeah. Exactly, exactly. But no, it, now, that being said, can I, di can, can I disprove what Edgar Fouché said? No, but what many UFO believers and researchers and enthusiasts fail to realize Anyone that is making an, an extraordinary claim, it is incumbent on them to provide evidence that it's real, not on me to say it's not real. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. You know, that's like a, a lot of the skeptics. I get in arguments with skeptics off podcast. I, I, I do a lot of off air. <laughs> <laughs> I have to because it's just my nature. But <laughs> I do these off air interviews and what some of the people I talk to are skeptics. And I, I only ask them, like, well, what do you think? And instead of them giving me an idea what they think, they attack everything. I'm like, I didn't ask you to attack. I said, sure. what do you think? And so he's like, well, they got to prove to me it's not real. I'm like, well, I mean, I, I guess you got to prove to me that they aren't, right? Like, right, like, right, <laughs> right. Well, and sometimes you find lack in, lack of critical thinking. I, I've gotten into discussions with people where they'll say, uh, like with Edgar Fouché or Bob Lazar, well, they describe things at Area 51 that other people said was was legitimate. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll tell you uh, what, what, real quick, I have to give this to you. There is an interview Bob Lazar did in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And he was, this, and I remember seeing as a kid, uh, sure. it was well, so anyway, he's describing how these things would belly up and travel the direction of the belly. And as a yeah. kid, you're like, that guy's crazy. And yeah. then you watch the gimbal video and you're like, that guy got it right. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, again, I, I, I Perhaps Lazar is is correct, but all I'm saying is there's not enough right. verifiable evidence to support his story, in my opinion. Right. Um, but I've had people say, but he described things at Area 51 that other employees said were accurate. Well, I work at a hospital. I, I work in hospital administration. I work at a hospital. I can describe the uh, employee access areas that the general public doesn't know about. And then I can tell you that on uh, January of last year, small little gurneys were brought in and there were dead alien bodies on those. Well, yeah. I gave you verifiable information in the form of I could tell you what the hospital looks like in the employee areas, but that doesn't give any support to the ludicrous claim that I saw dead aliens there. Yep. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I, I, I agree. I agree. You know, that's I'm going to do a documentary, right? When I get out there, David, I'm doing a documentary my side. I'm an aggressive person. Meaning <laughs> I, I don't like the word no. And I don't like maybes if I'm out there, there's a very, so in this documentary, there's a very strong chance that if I see something, I'm going to start running at it because I, oh, sure. I'm not going to sleep well, unless I get the actual proof in hand. You know, it'll drive oh, absolutely. Me nuts. Well, I'll tell you when I, when I first got involved in the nineties, I was much younger and, uh, and there was a wave of uh, or a, a UFO flap around Springfield, Missouri, and within about a 50, 60 mile radius of there. And I was going down with other researchers and investigators, and we were setting up every night in fields where the weekend before they had mutilated cattle or a UFO was seen hovering over the trees. You mentioned police officers earlier, Adam. I've interviewed local, county, and state Missouri police officers, Illinois police officers when I was living in the Midwest, uh, tons of police officers over the years, and uh, talking to Missouri Highway Patrol that had seen things. And I would tell people that, well, you know, there was a UFO supposedly sighted here and there was mutilated cows found over in this field. And we're going to set up and spend all night out there with cameras and infrared photography equipment and parabolic recording uh, microphones to record any sounds. And people thought it was crazy. You know, it's like, you're crazy for going out there. It's like, to your point, Adam, if you're interested in studying the phenomenon, you want to get out in the field where it's occurring, if you can, when, especially when there's a sustained area of activity like that, which it was at the time right. and still is to some degree. Um, but yeah, and if you see something, I'm like you, Adam, I'm going to run towards it. 
Yeah, I mean, that's why I'm building a network. I'm building. I'm like, people here. Here's what I tell people about the podcast. I think they're a little confused. I'm not just sitting here trying to, you know, ask people questions and, and put them in positions. And I'm actually building a network. So when I get out there, I have people to contact. I'm going to go here. Gonna, so I'm going to do every stop I go to. It's going to be the big five. Uh, UFOs, paranormal, anything paranormal. If Bigfoot's there, I'm going to try it out. And <laughs> and even some of the old homicides, I, I'm going to make sure. the most of this this thing. So when I'm out there. I don't plan on just sitting back and trying to get some film footage. You know, I've spoken to I've spoken to Doug Wilson from uh, from MUFON, right? He's Good a, friend of mine. Yeah, and he's given me some really helpful tips on what to use as far as equipment. And the rest of that's just going to be blatant stupidity running at these things. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, Doug's been down here to the the archives and, and gone through and collected a lot of uh, research as some of the other Colorado MUFON people have. Yeah, I like Doug, man. He's he's so level. Like, and, and, yeah. and you can learn a lot from the guys. It's like I'm learning a lot from you. You yeah, know? no, like you said, I, I completely agree. Doug's a solid individual. Uh, Mufon uh, is is blessed to have him yeah. in his role, and uh, and and a lot of other people. I have to tell you, Adam, I'm not a member of Mufon anymore because I just developed my own area of research and started collecting all this material, doing archiving and such. But I still have great com connections, communication with Mufon. And one of the things I love more than anything, I love networking with people, like you were alluding to earlier. And I love the fact that I get the opportunity to be invited to come to Florida, to go to Ohio, to Arizona, Ca uh, California, Colorado, and get to meet all these different individuals from different states with their own cases, their own narratives, their own areas of research. And it's just, it's such a pleasure to be able to do that. And on a more uh, a, a higher level scale, um, in the last, I would say, two years since Unidentified aired, as you mentioned, uh, where I was with Chris Mellon talking about triangles, and then I had the opportunity to work with Ross Colthart on his Seven Network uh, documentary, The Phenomenon, that has basically aired all over the, the globe. The outpouring of international interest um, has been amazing, and that's always been a dream of mine, Adam is to be able to have a network of international researchers all sharing information and collaborating because let's be honest, it's a global phenomenon. We need to have global uh, resources and uh, sources of information. And uh, I just got invited, I'll be doing a virtual lecture uh, for uh, a group in Brazil. And we're gonna have representatives from Canada, the UK, Portugal, uh, Venezuela, and I'm just so excited about that because it's it, it. Sometimes we have a parochial mindset with our state, with our city, yep. with our country. But to be able to have that global international dialogue, I think it's it's vital to coming closer to finding answers to this mystery. Beyond so, and that's like when you were saying when you left MoveFun, you're you know you're compiling your own thing and you're doing. Listen, you have to do that. MoveFun's wonderful. Everyone in MoveFun's wonderful. Absolutely, you, you need. Uh, people to branch out, create other groups. Because listen, if the government operated on one three-letter acronym, that would be it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No, we all have our areas of expertise. Right. And I always encourage people in the field or those getting into the field, find what resonates with you. Find where your passion is and just pursue that, you know, and, and, and mine just, you know, it went from in-field investigation, which I still will do occasionally if, if the opportunity presents itself. But I just, I have this massive collection of historical case files and material and scanning it, making it available to researchers globally, and then being able to do my own research with it as it relates to the triangles. It's just extremely rewarding. And I, I will be receiving another massive collection. Uh, I, I want to mention this. My, my friend and colleague, Philip Mantle in the UK, uh, is making arrangements as we speak to uh, ship out a, a pallet of UFO case files and material that he's collected over the last 40 to 50 years. And it incorporates UK UFO case files and information as well as uh, other uh, European case files. So I, we're going to be incorporating that. And before I forget, I always forget this part, it's not just me collecting this information to hopefully get it all digitized and made available. My entire collection, if something should ever happen to me, is going to go to the University of New Mexico. I've lectured there on the UFO subject. I have incredible connections with the University of New Mexico here in Albuquerque. My entire collection, lock, stock, and barrel, will go to the university where they will preserve it and make it available to the general public and future generations of researchers. So that legacy of material and case files and information will continue to the next generation to continue 
investigating and trying to find answers. I commend that. I mean, young minds, new ideas. Absolutely. It's, it's, I commend that that's needed. What you're doing, everything you're doing is needed. And it's, it's the reason why a lot of people in different, you know, professions, they, when you're on TV and you're speaking about ufology, p- people draw it out a bit because you, again, you're not overly invested in one thing. You stay very balanced and it's really intelligent the way you do it. Well, I try. I mean, sometimes it's a struggle <laughs> as I think you and your audience can appreciate uh, it's easy to go down, you know, the rabbit hole of belief or to start leaning one way or the other regarding certain things. But, you know, I try to be truly objective. Uh, you know, I always say I just envision myself as being a juror in a court of law. I'm just simply hearing the testimony, the evidence, and I'm trying to make uh, rational, objective decisions based on the available data. Oh, that was great said because I had uh, I had uh, Dylan Jones in a show and uh, he's a parapsychologist and his that's his big thing. Is, Can I take this to court? What I'm investigating, the first thing in my mind is, can I take this to court? Absolutely. So. I mean, in, in my book, I talk about, you know, there's different bars of establishing something. It, you know, the, the, the easiest bar is the court of public opinion, right? People believe you or accept you or based on criteria of their own, they accept what you're saying. But then there's the, the court of law where obviously the burden of proof is a little bit higher. Right. And of course, the highest bar, as it should be, is that within the realm of science, um, and I think we should use the scientific method, but I think at the same time, you have to look at the scientific method and, and the way that we use it. The scientific method is predicated on the idea that we can take something in a controlled environment and investigate it. Yeah. But that assumes that we're on the top of the intellectual food chain. Yeah, I was just going to say that's 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 under the assumption that we can do that, right? And. <laughs> And there are efforts underway, though. There's many uh, in-field efforts right now to, to, to catalog, record, and monitor UFOs or UAPs. Uh, there's, there's several different projects right now out there attempting to do that. But I think you and your audience will agree, if we're dealing with a technologically superior group or groups, we're kind of at their mercy. Exactly. We, can't, it, we can't expect them or know where they're going to be, when they're going to be. All we can do is what we've done historically in the past is set up in areas where historically there have been patterns of activity with the idea that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. I'm glad you said it. I, I saw a meme where there's rats in a cage and they were taking notes of the scientists outside. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, I, it's, I'm glad you brought that up too, because I, I use the analogy that much like uh, the scientist in the laboratory, if we're the mice and the intelligences behind these UFOs or UAPs are the scientists, the skeptics always say, well, where, give me a piece of that UFO. Let me see, you know, I need physical evidence. Yeah. How can I, the mouse running through the maze, you know, Produce presuppose that, yeah. that I'm yeah. going to, that I'm going to somehow get that ballpoint pin out of the, out, out of the pocket protector of that nerdy scientist. Right. <laughs> it's not I just, happen. I can't. And it's just based on my position or my rung on the intellectual ladder. I think this, and this is what I firmly believe. I believe in the next, in the next decade, not just compelling evidence, but very compelling evidence is going to come to light because again, Private industry is going up there. I, I really believe, I'm not saying that we're going to sit down and have talks with them. I just think that the world over, even though it should be already, I want all the evidence from, forget 2017, the all the evidence period over the course of, of history plus 2017, I think we should already be at the point like, all right, there's no doubt. But I, I think within the next decade, we're going to, the words no doubt going to be very, very prevalent. Well, let me just say this regarding the, the recent military UAP disclosures with the, the DOD videos, et cetera. Um, I, again, I said back in 2013 when I wrote my book that uh, I don't believe that any government of the world is going to disclose this unless it's in their best interest. Um, and they're just not arbitrarily going to do it out of good faith or they suddenly just, you know, decided after decades long denials, we're just going to come forward because, <laughs> you know, we, we've had a change of heart. No, that that's not even the extreme, I think. Um, I did state, though, and I fear that we might be here now. And I don't mean to say that in a malevolent way. Uh, I feel that they're disclosing this information because they know much more than we do. And I feel that they're disclosing it because 
they see that there's an uptick in activity. And I don't say that again, arbitrarily, I'm not just plucking that idea out of my brain. When you look back at the uh, Navy spokesman, when they, in follow-up to the DOD disclosures with the videos, they stated that the Navy was going to formulate uh, and codify reporting uh, systems for their Navy pilots to report these UAPs. What a lot of people didn't seize upon, though, the Navy spokesman goes on to state, due to the increased frequency of UAP activity near sensitive military operations areas. So what I think, and again, speculation on my part, let me preface that, I always like to throw a qualifier in there. I think that they're seeing a continual uptick in activity that will, if it continues on that trend, will reach a point where covering the subject up is completely untenable. So I think rather than the tail wagging the dog, they're trying to get ahead of the story before we reach that, that point of critical mass where they can't deny it anymore simply because these things are so prevalent. I agree. I, you know, after you saying that too, I put that a thought and I agree. That's, you know, I said it too, because it, you're seeing more and more like the Navy pilots, I'm sure over the course of time, tons of pilots have seen these things. I just don't think that they've ever gotten that close. So I have to oh, agree ab- with you. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've talked to a number of pilots that, that have confided in me of things that they have seen, not military pilots. These were commercial and private pilots that have told me of things that they never told anybody else. And it's so funny, uh, Adam, before, again, this erosion of skepticism that we're starting to see in our society, I've had men and women come up to me over the last 32 years and say, I want to tell you about my UFO sighting, but don't tell my wife or don't tell my husband. Right. We literally were sharing personal experiences that they d- didn't even feel comfortable confiding in with their spouse. It makes sense, you know, and that's so that being said, I again I believe that I think in the near future it's going to be it's going to be a little bit more spoken about publicly. I'm hoping I agree. I'm yeah. hoping we have some interventions currently where something takes the attention away from all the the stress and pressures on planet earth here and maybe pulls our direct, our, our attention. Maybe, I don't know. That's just hopeful thinking. I think, but well, it, it, back to your point though, it gives perspective, doesn't it? That it's not all about us. It's not all about our country. It's not all about our planet. It is a larger framework and it, it provides a, a larger context for who we are. I've often said in, in 30 plus years of studying the subject, I haven't learned about aliens, but I have learned about humans. <laughs> yeah, that's truth. You know, it's like the paranormal guys say too, like when we're out there investigating the paranormal, the most dangerous thing around us are the people. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, that's the truth. Well, David, it's been a pleasure. I enjoyed having you on. I'm going to have you on again. We're going to isolate yeah, some subjects. Very good. Great discussion, Adam, and thank you for your patience. I know we've been trying to line this up for a while, and I appreciate you working with my crazy schedule. Oh, I, I appreciate having you on. You're like the rock star right now, man, you know? And so. if you ever find yourself in Albuquerque, I'd love for you to come by and see the archives in person. I'm going to make sure I go there. It's going to be on my tour. When I do the documentary, I'm going to include that into it. Believe there me, I'm go. going. There you go. Well, anyway, David, it's been a pleasure. We will do this again, and I appreciate your time as usual. Thank you, Adam. Have Take a good care. night.